Revelation 3, 14, and unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things saith the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. He does. He knows mine. He knows yours. That thou art neither hot nor cold. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth because thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Lord, I pray that you'd guide me and empower me and direct me by your spirit the very best i know this is the portion of your word where you want us to be tonight i do not know the needs of every person here i couldn't know that but if i did know it i couldn't address them but you can and i pray that you would in this time draw us to yourselves convict us encourage us help us to act in obedience to all that you tell us and we'll thank you for what you do in jesus name amen the Lord Jesus comes to the church at Laodicea and he makes a pronouncement about them. It really doesn't sound too bad to me at first. He said, I know that thy, thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm. Hey, I'm all right with that. When I was in school, sorry for the Molinar, but C's were my friend. I liked C's. C's kept me from getting in trouble. C's kept me from getting grounded. C's uh, didn't require near as much work as A's or B's. Little boy came home from school. His mom said, Were you a good boy today? And he thought of him and he said, No, ma'am. She said, Were you a bad boy today? And he thought of another one and he said, No, ma'am. She said, What kind of boy were you? He said, Well, Mom, I guess today I was just a comfortable boy. But then the Lord Jesus, he makes this pronouncement and says, You're not hot or cold, you're lukewarm. Let me see if I can illustrate this. I'd like three young men who'd be willing to help me. You're like, okay, come on up here, buddy. You're gonna stand right over here. What is your name? Tyler. Very good. He got it right the first time. We did not even practice. Tyler's going to represent a really, really good Christian. Tyler reads his Bible every day. Tyler goes to church every time the doors are open. Tyler gives the tithe and an offering. Tyler passes out tracts. He wins people to Christ. Tyler never watches bad stuff on television. He doesn't drink. He doesn't smoke. He doesn't dance. He doesn't search places he shouldn't on the Internet. And I can tell by your looks I picked the wrong person. I'm sorry. Uh, but Tyler's going to represent a really, really good Christian. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, he's a 10. I need another volunteer. Who else wants to help me? Okay, sir, what's your name? Seth. Seth? All right, Seth, go way down the other side, just about where Tyler is, only down there. And Seth is going to represent a really bad Christian. Seth never reads the Bible. He never prays, except he thinks he's about to die. He never goes to church, well, maybe on Christmas and Easter. When he's there, he not only didn't put anything in the offering, but he, he's watched by the ushers to make sure he doesn't take anything out. He uses bad language. He watches nasty stuff on the television. He smokes cigarettes and drinks booze and uses drugs, but he is saved. There are saved people like that. Used to be popular when I was a young man. There's this philosophy somebody had. There is no such thing as a carnal Christian. Always amazes me how people get smarter than God. Because God moved the spirit of Paul, the, 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 the spirit of God moved Paul to write to the church at Corinth, you are carnal. Well, I always say, you don't think there's any carnal Christians? Come to my church. I'll show you something. We got them there. Uh, but Seth is saved. He's trusted Christ as Savior, lousy Christian. All right, I need one more volunteer. I've been over there. I've been, uh, okay, yes, sir. Come on up here. What's your name? Isaac. All right. Isaac is a lukewarm Christian. Now, Isaac's not a bad guy. Stand right there and face everybody right in front of the Lord's Supper table. Isaac goes to church most of the time. He may miss if there's a really important ball game on. Isaac reaches about maybe three, four times a week. 
Isaac, uh, he'll pass out tracts. He'll show up on a big soul-winning blitz day. Uh, doesn't always go, but, you know, he does some. He's pretty separated from the world. He's pretty careful when he watches on TV. Uh, every once in a while, he gets engrossed in a program, and then it goes really bad, and he kind of wants to see the end of it, so he keeps watching. Maybe he shouldn't. But he's not a bad guy. Now, next Sunday, you're either going to have Isaac or Seth join your church. Somebody that comes to church some of the time or none of the time. Gives something, gives nothing. Does some work for God, does no work for God. Is somewhat separated and not at all separated. You say, we want Tyler. You can't have him. I'm taking him back to Bridgeport, Michigan. After 44 years, we deserve one member like that. So would you rather have Isaac or would you rather have Seth? How many say, I want Seth? How many say, I want Isaac? I want Isaac. The Lord Jesus makes a pronouncement about the relationship of the lukewarm Christian, the lukewarm church to him. He says, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm. And then he makes a pronouncement not only about their relationship to him, but about his reaction to that, and it's really astounding. He says, I would thou wert cold or hot. One of our problems is we know the Bible or think we know it so well that we don't pay attention to what it says. Jesus just said, I'd rather you be like him than like you are. What? If I gave the invitation tonight and I said, uh, it's time we stop making the Lord Jesus upset with us and greed with us and wanting to spew us out of his mouth, and I want all you lukewarm Christians to promise God from now on you'll be a cold Christian. I not only wouldn't be invited back again, I wouldn't be here tomorrow. <laughs> but Jesus said that. Why did he say that? We have all kinds of reasons. People say, well, we like to drink cold things, we like to drink hot things, but we don't like to drink anything lukewarm. I don't know. Every morning when I leave our house, I go to the kitchen sink, pull out a 22-ounce glass, fill it with water straight from the tap, and drink it right down. Lukewarm. Uh, by the way, uh, what temperature do you like your potato chips? Do you freeze them or fry them? I don't know about you, but I'm real happy with a lukewarm peanut butter sandwich. <laughs> doesn't have to come out uh, from the freezer. doesn't have to have been grilled in the pan. I'll just take it room temperature. Why did the Lord Jesus say that? But he went on to say it's a really big deal. He said, because you're neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Now, that's a strong term. It literally means to vomit them out of his mouth. The Lord Jesus is saying to the lukewarm Christian, you make me sick to my stomach. I wonder why. A lot of reasons. We, we better look at the Bible. Uh, the Lord Jesus makes a... A pronouncement, and then he tells us about a perception. And this is really helpful and interesting. Here is the self perception of the Laodicean church, of the lukewarm Christian. He says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You know what the self perception of the lukewarm Christian is? I'm fine. Hey, I'm an independent fundamental Baptist. I'm in church on Sunday night, and so are you. We're not one of those churches canceled Sunday night service. We're not one of those churches decided to have a 10-minute sermonette for Christianettes to go out and smoke cigarettes after the service is over. We're not one of those churches that decides we want our young people to look just like the world. I mean, we're separated. We use the right Bible. We believe in coming to church. We believe in knocking on doors. Praise God. All those churches going liberal, and I'm glad we're not like them. And I'm glad too. I'm rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing used to go to a camp in the summer where they really preached hard and they really went for decisions every night after the service they would have a campfire and not just at the end of the week but every night and you'd sit around the campfire and you'd get up throw a piece of wood in and you'd give a testimony about the decision you'd made I was there one year I was about 15 years old and I knew what they would do and I stood up the first night and I said well I just want to say I'm glad to be able to start the week right with God doesn't that sound pious you know what I was saying? Don't expect me to make any decisions this week. Don't expect me to acknowledge I've had a bad attitude toward my parents or had the wrong friends or listened to ungodly music. No, I'm just fine, thank you. I'm rich and increased with goods, have need of nothing. We look at those 
Christians that are backsliding, those churches that are compromising, those people that are turning away from truth. We say, praise God, we're not doing what they're doing. We're solid, we're fundamental, we're right with God, we're biblical, and I'm glad. But remember the Lord Jesus, the Bible, the Word of God, never told us to be better than them. It told us to be like him. Because thou sayest, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not. The self-perception, I'm fine. The Savior's perception is about to come, but he says this, this is not a hypocrite. This is not somebody who has terrible sin in their life and pretending it's not there and covering it up. This is not that person. This is a person who has deceived themselves into thinking they're better than God thinks they are. And knowest not that thou art, here's the Savior's perception, poor and wretched and miserable and naked and blind. You don't even know about a shape you're in. You don't even know what you're missing. There's a lot of Christians like we hear somebody say, wow, we had a great prayer meeting last night. We say, oh, that's wonderful. But a great prayer meeting for us is one that's over real quick. Man, we had a wonderful time out soul winning. Well, that's nice, but uh, we'd rather not go. And a good night for us is maybe four cards and nobody home and 45 minutes eating Krispy Kreme donuts somewhere. We hear people say, man, I had a wonderful time reading the Word of God. And we read the Bible some, but it's never a wonderful time. It's just something we're supposed to do. And maybe once in a while we see something cool. Most of the time we just read it and it's over. And know us not. The Lord Jesus says to this church, you don't even know what you're missing. You don't even know what it's like to be close to me, to walk with me, to have the fellowship I want you to have, to have my power and my blessing on your life, to be used to me, to do things that matter for eternity. Now, here's the deal. You go to this guy and you say you are a lousy Christian. What's he going to say? I am not. I went to church twice last year, Christmas and Easter. Didn't even steal any money from the offering. I tried, but the ushers were watching. You go to this guy and say you're a lousy Christian. He says, wait a minute, what are you talking about? I'm in church most of the time. I read my Bible most of the time. I give most of the time. I may not be perfect. I'm not like Tyler Two Shoes, Goody Two Shoes over there, but I'm a pretty good person. See, we think of revival almost always as being for other people. Boy, if that backslidden Christian, if that guy that's had a terrible attitude, if that family that's gotten sideways and been out of church, if that fellow that's gotten back in the world and living for the devil, if they got right with God, man, that'd be a great revival. We, we don't really sing it out loud this way, but our attitude is revive him again. Fill his heart with your love. Lord, he's the one. He's the one. He's the one. He's the one. He's the one who needs revival. It's my brother and my sister, but not me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And the Lord Jesus says, I'll tell you why I wish you're cold or hot. At least you'd listen to me. You wouldn't be self-deluded. You wouldn't be self-deceived. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think that you're better than you are. You know what a lot of Christians are like? They know the world is bad. They know that, you know, if you mess around with a person in the office, you can lose your marriage. You start smoking dope. You can wind up becoming a drug addict and drinking booze. You can wind up becoming a drunkard. And we know there's all kind of terrible things that can happen if you get too far out in the world. But, but you know what a lot of us are like, especially those of us who grew up in church and especially young people. I worked at Sears when I was a young man in college a lot of the time in the shoe department every spring they had a big tennis shoe sale they put me in charge of getting the shoes ready for it one year they would take big galvanized steel garbage cans brand new garbage cans and they put the tennis shoes in them by size all the seven seven and a half eight they gave me a crew of special needs young men to help get the shoes out of the boxes and into the garbage cans We'd take them out of the box, we'd time together, we'd put them in the, bo- the right can, and I was making sure they did it right. One of the young men was interesting. He always did like this. Always. Never stopped. I thought, I wonder what he does when he sits down. I took the guys out to lunch. He sat down to lunch. He did this all the time when he sat down to lunch. One of those guys was named Ernest. Ernest had a receding chin and a prominent nose and beady little eyes. He looked like a weasel. Ernest didn't live too far from me, so I got to be taking him home at night, giving a ride home. Ernest got feeling comfortable with me, and one night he sat there in the car, and he looked at me and he said, did you ever, did you ever want to get a house and make it look like there was people in there, 
and then set it on fire and watch it burn? No, Ernest. I'd like to go hang gliding sometime. I might like to jump out of an airplane, but no, that one's not on my bucket list. And then I had this flash of thought. If I were a woman, I would have called this intuition. It's just a thought. I said, Ernest, you would never want to do that with real people in the house, would you? And his beady little eyes gleamed and his face glistened. And he said, I think it'd be fun. Now, Ernest had been away long enough before they let him out to <laughs> be wherever he was when he came to the shoe sale. And he had enough therapy that he knew you weren't supposed to burn down houses with people in them. But in his mind, he thought they were robbing him of something. He thought that they were keeping him from something really fun. He thought if he could do that, it'd really be great. And You know, a lot of Christians, they look over to the world, they hear the music and the laughter and the tinkling of glasses uh, wafts over the air to them, and they know it's bad, and they know it might hurt them, but they think maybe they're missing something. They think maybe this narrow-minded Christian life is a little restrictive and a little less fun than it ought to be. And I want to remind you, the world and the flesh and the devil do not have one good thing for the child of God. The devil's a liar from the beginning and a boat not in the truth. He's a murderer from the beginning. And when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. He is a liar and the father of it. All of his pearls are made of paste and all of his nickels are wooden nickels. Nothing good for the child of God over there. But if you're not walking with God like you ought to, if you're not walking in the Spirit, if you're not having fellowship with the Lord Jesus, sometimes that looks pretty good knowest not and the Lord Jesus I, I wish you'd be like him at least you'd listen to me fellas you did a really good job would you give them a hand they did a great job thank you Tyler <clears throat> thank you thank you Seth all right good job thank you you can go sit down see see Pastor Andrew afterwards he'll give you each 20 bucks maybe go ahead you can sit down buddy yeah good job you can sit down you can all Okay, very obedient. They want to be told individually, not assuming that what goes for one goes for the other. I like that. No group think here, no peer pressure. We're, we're, we have individual soul responsibility under God. Every man shall give account of himself. The Lord makes a pronouncement. You're not hot, you're not cold. Has a perception. He talks about you. Your self-perception is you're pretty good. My perception is you're pretty bad. And then he gives a prescription. I counsel thee. Wow. I hope you get counsel from your preacher. And a multitude of counselors there is safe. You hope you have a problem, a, there's an important decision. You go to them and, and get godly advice. But what if you could get counsel from Jesus? Would you take it? He's about to give it to us. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eyes have that thou mayest see. The Lord Jesus is attacking the Laodiceans at their areas of perceived strength. They had a banking industry they're proud of. And he said, what you need is not your material riches, but spiritual riches. They had a garment industry that was very prominent and very well thought of. And he said, you don't need those materials that you made. You need to be robed in the righteousness of Christ. They had an eye salve that they exported to other parts of the world that people would pay good money to get, and it helped people's eyesight. But he said, what you need is not earthly eyesight, but spiritual perception. He said, hey, listen to me. And then he said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. The first part of the Savior's prescription to the lukewarm church is acknowledge your sin. You say, be rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. You don't even know how bad you are. Have you ever heard of a really good Christian or somebody who at least had a very prominent position and you found out they were doing something really bad? And you ever thought, how could they do that? I think I figured out how they do that. They do that the same way you do the stuff you do. Oh, bro, wait a minute, I don't know anything like that. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Thou sayest. I'm rich and increased with goods. Have need of nothing. 
And the Lord Jesus says, you've got to repent. The word repent is made up of two other words in the Greek. The one means to perceive, and the other means afterward. My wife's sister, who's pastor's husband across town from us, uh, I think watches the Weather Channel about 22 hours a day. And uh, Christy always say, my wife will say, Kathy said such and such about the weather. Okay. So suppose that I'm going somewhere to preach, going to drive, and she, Christy calls me and she says, honey, Kathy called me, and there's going to be three inches of ice on all the roads tonight. Do you think you ought to cancel the meeting? And I would say, nah, it'll be fine. That is a male response. Nah, it'll be fine. I get in the car. I go to drive. There is three inches of ice on the road. I can barely keep the car out of the ditch. And I say, whoa, I'm going to wreck. I'm going to spend the night in this ditch. I only got a half tank of gas. I'll probably freeze to death. I better get off of here and find some place to spend the night. I just repented. I didn't perceive it ahead of time. I perceived it afterward. We like that verse, and I like it. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But that word confess didn't mean to say, Lord, I blew it, I'm sorry. It means to say the same thing as. It means to, to, to say what God says. You know what God says? He says, would you quit making excuses? Would you quit diminishing it? Would you quit comparing yourself to somebody else? And would you stop saying what you've been saying about your sin and start saying what I say about your sin? Acknowledge your sin. But there's a second part of his prescription. We love this next verse. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Uh, we'll sometimes use that verse. People will in giving somebody the gospel. But the verse is not written to give the gospel. It's not written to the unsaved. It's written to the church at Laodicea. And it's one of the saddest verses in the entire Word of God because it places the Lord Jesus outside the door of his own church. And he's knocking and asking entrance to not the heart of a sinner, but to the church that he died for. And he says, if any man, that's a subjunctive mode which indicates doubt. It's almost like the Lord Jesus wonders if anybody at all is interested in him. And he's saying, look at, I know you got six hours to spend on the internet. Look at, I know you want to check up on all your Facebook friends. Look at, I know you got all the Twitter things you want to check out. And look at, I know you got your ball games. I know you have your hobbies. I know you want to hunt. I know you want to fish. I know you want to go ahead and redecorate the house. But is anybody interested in me? Does anybody want to talk to me? Does anybody want to have fellowship with me? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door. Here is the second part of the prescription. Part one was to acknowledge your sin. Part two is to admit the Savior. Do you know how close you are to God right now? You are exactly as close as you want to be. But the Bible says, behold, I, the Bible says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If this time in your Christian life is not the best time in your Christian life, the time when you're closest to God, who do you suppose moved? Admit the Savior. I was in seventh grade Detroit Michigan my dad ran the Detroit Rescue Mission for 10 years born in the south graduated from college and high school in the south spent some time in Michigan when I was younger and there now and there's a girl in a class named Rosemary I liked Rosemary <laughs> I thought she was cute I thought Rosemary was the cutest girl in the class if I'd have picked any girl in that class to be my girlfriend I'd have picked Rosemary one day, Rosemary was sitting in front of me, and she turned around and had a piece of paper. It had three names written on it, and she pointed to the first name, and she said, that's my boyfriend at, ch at church. I didn't recognize the name. I said, well, that's nice. She pointed to the second name. I did not recognize it either. She said, that's my boyfriend at home. I said, well, that's interesting. She pointed to the third name. I recognized the third name. It was my name. And she said, that's who I want for my boyfriend at school. Don't laugh. Anybody ask you to be their school boyfriend? <laughs> I like her. I thought she's cute. 
I thought she was the cutest girl in the class. If I'd have picked any girl in that class to be my girlfriend, I'd have picked Rosemary. And she said, I want you to be my school boyfriend. And I said, I'm not interested. I didn't know much about it in the seventh grade. But I knew enough to know that I didn't want to be part of a trio. I knew enough to know that if I was going to be somebody's boyfriend, I was going to be their all-the-time boyfriend. You know what we say to Jesus? Jesus, I want you to be part of my life. We kind of do it like this. Jesus, I talked to you on the way to work, but if you wouldn't mind waiting in the car, the guys at work, they're kind of rough, and, you know, they tell some stories they shouldn't, and I'll sometimes laugh at them because you got to go along to get along, but I'll talk to you at lunchtime. Jesus, last night we had some people over in the church, and we had a great fellowship. We honored your name. Now, tonight we got some old friends over, and, and you might, you might want to slip outside. But we'll talk to you before we go to bed. Jesus doesn't want to be part of your life. Jesus doesn't only want to be the most important part of your life. He does. The Bible says in Colossians that in all things he might have the preeminence. And as I understand it, that means first in order and foremost in importance. But the Bible says more than that. It says when Christ, who is our life, shall appear. He's the one who died for us. He's the one who saved us. He's the one we serve. He's the one whose name we lift up. He's the one we're hoping to fall at the feet of and cast crowns at his feet and give him the last tangible gift of our entire existence. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He's not part of our life. He he is our life. William Randolph Hearst was a very wealthy man, a newspaper man. He collected art and he heard about a little painting he wanted. It was a valuable painting, but not extremely so. He called in an agent that he employed for these kind of things and said, hey, get me this painting. I don't care if it's a good deal. Just get it to me. I want to have it as part of my collection. The agent came back after some time, and he said, Mr. Hurst, I found the painting. Good, did you buy it? He said, no, sir, I cannot buy you that painting. You can buy me the painting. Everybody's got their price. He said, no, sir, Mr. Hurst, I can't buy you that painting. He said, why not? He said, I found it crated up in the basement of a warehouse that you own. Mr. Hurst, you bought it a long time ago with a bunch of other stuff. What a perfect metaphor for how most Christians spend their life. They run around looking for something to make them happy, looking for something to give them joy, looking for something that'll matter to them. Maybe a bigger house, maybe a nicer car, maybe a better job, maybe a boyfriend, maybe a husband, maybe a spouse, maybe if they could have children, maybe if they had grandchildren, maybe if they could take that special vacation and they run here and they hurry there and they purchase this and they consume that. And all the time they're looking for something they already have and his name is Jesus. heard a story about a wealthy man the preacher that told the story says one of the wealthiest men in the british isles he had one son who had been killed in world war ii fighting with the royal air force his wife had died the rich man died and he had a big collection of art and it was announced the art was going to be put up for sale at southby's the famous auction house in england unusual so many paintings of so much value would be offered at one time and a lot of interest and the crowd gathered there for the big auction and the auctioneer banged his gavel on the table and he said ladies and gentlemen thank you for coming according to the terms of the estate this is the first item we must auction off and he reached over and pulled the canvas the cover off of a painting on an easel it was the painting of the dead man's dead son painted by an unknown artist, essentially worthless. People there wanted the frame more than they wanted the painting. Nobody said anything. But there's a man that had been a servant to that wealthy man. He loved him. He loved his son. He thought, I'd like that painting. I'd like to remember my master, remember his son, and he bid just a few dollars and he got the painting. The auctioneer awarded him the bid. And he said, now, folks, really thank you for coming. I know it's going to be very unusual. But I must tell you that according to the terms of the estate, this auction is over. And man, there was a big hubbub. And he banged and banged and banged and banged. And finally, they quieted down enough that he could explain. Because according to the terms of the estate, whoever purchased the picture of the son was to be given the entire collection. And brothers and sisters, as I understand the word of God uh, and the New Testament in particular, that's what it says. It says in him, in Jesus, we have all things that pertain unto life and godliness. My Bible says if you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. But if you have Jesus, you have everything. 
I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm. I would thou work cold or hot. So then because thou art neither cold nor hot, but lukewarm, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. No, it's not that thou art poor and wretched and miserable and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eyes have that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me.